I, I really want to start out saying, you know, had I known all I had to do is lose money to get to Harvard, I would have lost it a lot quicker. <laughs> So it's an incredible topic we're going to be talking tonight. And I also want to ask everybody, um, I've spent a lot of money in education, and I know you've spent a lot of money in education, and I do have uh, a gift, and I'm going to offer it to everybody um, at the end of my presentation. And I have a feeling I'm going to help your student loans disappear just like that. Absolutely. Okay? Just like that. All right, so in a moment, we're going to hear about my story about losing money, and making a comeback and losing money and making another comeback, losing money. And I really do want to get to the final comeback because we only have around 45 minutes. Um, because where I'm at right now, I run a $100 million real estate portfolio. Half of it is mine and my partners that we control and have a majority interest in it. And it's really an incredible story. But like every incredible story, um, you know, we got we to start from perhaps, you know, down here. But the exciting part of all this is my incredible story kind of starts sitting in a chair just like everybody because I was finishing up my final semester at the University of Amsterdam in a coffee house uh, taking a psychology class. And I had realized that um, college was over for me in like seven or 14 days and it was really time to figure out what I was going to do next. So what do we do as college students? We fly home to mom and dad and we try to get it all together. I didn't have a job waiting for me. I didn't really have any plans. I always knew that I was going to have my own business, but I didn't really have a plan. So they were in the clothing business and I took a job selling, very important selling. Nothing happens until something is sold. There's always going to be a war between operations and sales, selling. So I took a job in selling. I was selling shirts and I was making $100 a day. And on the East Coast, I would travel around from shopping mall to shopping mall to shopping mall. I'd set up and I would literally just stand in the middle of the aisle and, and walk over to ladies and tell them how beautiful they were going to look in my shirts. Mm -hmm. And what really kept me going was I had a goal and I wrote it down. And you really have to write things down. And this goal was $10,000, I'm going to save $10,000, I'm going to get 100 of these, and I'm going to slowly place them into a safe deposit box every week. And I did that. And I'm telling you, it was like third or fourth month into it. It was 97, 98, 99, 10,000. 10,000 dollars, and I'm going to go make millions of dollars. And I came up with a plan. And the plan was like this. I was going to take an office downtown New York City on John Street in the financial district. I was going to rent a cheap room and I was going to start an import-export business. Where's my import-export business? Right there. I didn't know what I was going to import, I didn't know what I was going to export, but I had a computer, I had a phone, and I had an office. So the government offers a lot of programs on, on trying to establish relationships with other countries and other products, and I got involved, I was networking, I was going out to the the meetings, but I'm like three or four months into this right now and I realize my $10,000 cash is looking more like $5,000 cash. So I had to make a hard choice. And the hard choice really was, do I do what everyone else is doing when they graduate college and go get a job? I probably was capable of, you know, whatever, working at McDonald's. And, or do I give up my apartment and move into my office downtown New York and that's exactly what I did because I, wanted, I just had to have my own business. It was my hunger. It was my desire. So I got to tell you, during that time, I'm, so I'm living in 300 square feet in an office building. I got to pretend I'm not living there. So I got to sneak in, sneak out, join the gym in the World Trade Center. I was in the best shape of my life. I was always going to the gym. I wasn't even working out half the time, and I was always going to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, what do I do? It's not happening for me and I'm really running out of money so like a student I sign up for another course and I took an import export course in the World Trade Center and I remember just staring at this one instructor and he's talking about how how Venezuela is going to be the next market and the, 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 the patrol over there the importing exporting it's so corrupt 
So what you need to do is you need to go over there and set up your own shop and import some materials, but create American products in Venezuela. So I'm sitting there staring at the instructor, and I'm like, I'll do it. And I'm saying to myself, inside, I'll do it. I'll do it. And it, it, bur I'll do it! <laughs> it burst out like that. And I ended up hiring this guy, the instructor, as a consultant. And next thing I know, I'm headed back to my home office. And I'm sitting there, and I'm creating the plan. And a week or two goes by. I got my marketing plan. I got my, my pro formas, uh, business plan. And it turns out I needed around $500,000. So the good news was, well, I needed to raise $500,000, but I can kick in $2,000. So I really only needed 498k. <laughs> So I'm sitting there, I'm just in this office, and by the way, so I mean, it's, it's probably around 12 o'clock, and the way this would work was I would tape sheets to the window to keep the lights out. There's no, no curtains. Um, I, uh, my, my seat was a, like a, a futon, so that would turn into my bed, and I'm just sitting there in my bed, and I'm saying, well, where am I going to get a half a million dollars from? And I'm thinking... Well, my sisters dated a few rich guys when I was growing up. <laughs> you know, maybe you know, I can call a few of them. And it turns out I got their phone numbers, and I called them. And I created this whole pitch. I picked up some products. I decided it was going to be a soap business, chemical business. Um, so I got some products. I put some labels on them. And I actually, they, they had me over at the golf club, and I pitched them. And I'm thinking, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'll do it. Next thing I know, they, I, I got it. You know, I, not, I didn't get that to all 500000 from them, but I got most of the money from them, and I got friends and family. So now I got $501,000 down to my last $1,000, and I am ready to go to Venezuela, and I'm ready to go clean up South America, and I'm ready to manufacture soap. So just before I leave, I learned that I can't wire money into this country. I don't know why not. I just thought all well, markets kind of had wire, you know, going back and forth. <laughs> so I got a problem. Um, everything's in motion, and I'll tell you what I did. Um, that day I got on the plane, I wore a fanny belt, <laughs> and I strapped three hundred thousand dollars to my body. Oh my God. All right. <laughs> this is just, you know, the hunger. You got to stay hungry. Less <laughs> brown, right? <laughs> All right, so I'll, I'll never forget. I land in Caracas. I think it's the capital. And it's 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'm just, I'm just happy to be there, and, and I'm going to create this business, and life is great. And, and I see, like, the, the National Guard there and, you know, all the kids carrying their AK-47s at airports like that. <laughs> and it just never dawned on me. I just, you know, I just, you know hey, how you doing? And, you know, filled out a few uh, forms and walked right through, and there I am. Got in a taxi and uh, went over to the hotel. No one even stopped me. So, of course, now, as I'm a little wiser and older, the hindsight's absolutely inc you know, insane. So, that's it. So, I, I'm, I'm at this hotel, and um, I'm really into heavy metal, so I'm listening to heavy metal just to keep every, you know, help me think clear. And I'm waiting for, uh, I have an agent or two meeting me at the hotel the next morning. And... Um, that's it. I, I, you know, I just step up and I'm like, this is what we're going to do. You guys are going to go get me an apartment and we got to get a warehouse. And um, so I got an apartment in a place called Las Mercedes. I got a, a 5,000 square foot warehouse in a, in a place called uh, Las Mariches. And we started hiring factory workers. I started interviewing <coughs> accountants. I started interviewing chemical engineers. And I got this whole plan coming together, coming together. And then I realized the consultant that that kind of got me into this mess in the first place. I gave him a $50,000 check before I left. I ordered a bunch of chemicals and the, the, the ingredients and some, uh, an agitator to mix this stuff up. And eight weeks into it, there's no container. So now I'm like, holy shit. I pick up the phone, I call him, and there's no answer. And I call the school and he's gone. And then I called some other students and they kind of laughed at me. Like, didn't you hear? Or it was like a Ponzi scheme. He got a few students. That everybody was buying something from each other. And I'm the only one that flew to Venezuela. I was like the final. I was the last guy who didn't have a seat to sit down in. So the first check I wrote for this operation was stolen from me. I was ripped off. $50,000. All 
All right, so I panic a little, and I come up with this plan. Well, I'm just going to go buy everything in Venezuela. And, and I find this area. It's called Maracaibo. And we go down there. We find a factory that just went out of business. And I got everything like five cents on, on their dollar, whatever that was, boulevards. And we get everything over to my, my warehouse. And like two to four weeks later, I got like a state-of-the-art factory. It was like a, a gift. And next thing I know, we, we, we start. We're, we're manufacturing products. We started, I had to change the plan a little, the whole American idea, but we had like the, the eagle and the flag and the red, white, and blue, and it's still like an American product made in Venezuela. So next thing we do, the sales force is doing what they're supposed to be doing. The product's starting to get out there. Um, it's slowly um, going into supermarkets, but you'll find when you're in business, maybe for the first time, you know, you could be making a lot of money, but Sometimes your expenses, you just can't get above your expenses. So I need to do something drastic because I'm starting to see the end of this, my first business. Um, I'm at a restaurant one night and I walk into the bathroom and I'm just kind of like, what is it going to be? What is it going to be? And, uh, I walk up to the sink, I, I turn the sink on, I'm washing my hands. And, you know, remember the, you know, the soap dispensers where the powder used to come down? I'm like, what the fuck? Where's, where's the soft soap? And I'm like, I had like an aha moment. There's no soft soap in Venezuela. So that's it. We're going to manufacture, we're going to be the first ones to bring soft soap to Venezuela. Get on a plane, head back to New York, go get the other $150,000 or $200,000, bring that back into the country with a <laughs> bunch of samples of soft soap. No problems, just whisked right through customs again. And uh, we knocked it off. We, we figured it out. Um, we made soft soap. And that was one of the turning points for the business because we really started getting picked up by big distributorship. And I also realized that um, there was a private label market that they didn't know about. So some of the huge distributors in this country um, were just uh, very excited to see their name on products. So we, just start, so we did a private label business as well. And not enough time, but sales were just skyrocketing. So I'm like 12, I'm like, I think I'm like 18 months into this right now, and you know, sometimes in life, you gotta celebrate. You gotta stop to celebrate. We're all hard workers, I get it. But sometimes, we celebrate a little too much. <laughs> so we had this Miranda outside the, the warehouse in the mountains, and it was just, we would go there for lunch, and we, butlers, and, and it was just very, very affordable, and, and I'm living the dream, white suits and, and hats, and Cuban cigars are legal, and and great alcohol, and you know, I'm just kind of feeling fulfilled. And I'm like, I told everyone I'm gonna do it. I, I, mean, this, I mean, we're making a lot of money. The markup on this stuff, the ROI is just off the charts. So that day, I'm driving home from the factory, and I get pulled over by a cop, but these aren't the ordinary cops. These, are, these cops are, they dress in black, they're in black motorcycles, um, the Venezuelans were calling them like the death patrol. I just called them Nazis. <laughs> and I don't like Nazis. Um, you know, I, my Spanish wasn't that good, but I'm like, uh, por favor, lo siento, um, yo necesito, llamo mi abogado. I got to call my lawyer because I was always told to call my lawyer if I ever had a problem. Pick up the phone and explaining to Bernardo Bentada, the lawyer, what's just happened. And uh, Bernardo talks to the cop. And Bernardo comes back to me and he goes, hey, Alan, remember I told you I can help you out with anything in this country, but if you get taken into jail, you're on your own. I can't help you once you're in jail. What you're going to do is you're going to reach down into your wallet, you're going to pull it out, and you're going to open it up, and you're going to give them all the money in your wallet. Okay, so I do that, and next thing I know, this jackass, he just takes my whole entire wallet, and he looks at me, and he leaves. So now I'm just starting to get this feeling like, I've never been in a life-threatening situation before. Now this guy knows where I live, and he knows my business, and um, something's happening here. And while I'm driving down this mountain, I'm starting to notice that there's National Guard everywhere, more than ever. And something's changing in this country. There's been coups there before. Maybe there's one happening right now. I get home, turn on the TV, and something happened with the IMF, and there was a huge devaluation and gasoline prices skyrocketed. There was, there was a lot of blood in the, in the, in the streets. And next thing I know, um, there's hyperinflation. And you might study economics, but until you live in a third world country and experience five to 10, 
um, uh, inflation monthly, it's, it's hard to stay in business. And then the government steps in and they tell you, you have to stamp a price on what you're selling and you have to give your employees raises so they can afford to uh, weather the storm of the devaluation and, and, and inflation. And everyone's getting a break, but the manufacturer, even, even the suppliers of the materials, um, they were hoarding their products. They can hold on to them for a month or two or three months and sell it 20% higher. Um, it, it, was the, it was the beginning of the end of the end for me. And then I had this one buddy fly down from New York. He was a CPA. He wanted to change his life. It wasn't his passion. Um, he's trying to help me out of this. He's trying to help me liquidate. It was beyond liquidation because now I had too many credit lines out there. People weren't paying me what they owed me. And um, I was, I might have to flee this country because you don't want to be a foreigner owing people money in Venezuela. So what we do is, so, so he pulls this New York attitude on me. He's like, Alan, this is complete bullshit. And he's looking at all these invoices. So there's, there's a supermercado right next to my apartment. Guy owes me $5,000. Roy's like, we're going to go down there. We're going to go get the money. And it's going to be the beginning of something new. So I, I'm beaten now. I just went from seeing my whole life go down the drain like soap. And <clears throat> he wants to go get $5,000. So we do that. We go to the supermercado. And the guy feels the pain because he's, he's having the same problems. And Roy's like, Al, go get two carts. Go fill them up with alcohol. If he doesn't pay us, we're taking it in alcohol. <coughs> so that's what we do. We get two huge sharpening carts, carts. The guy's okay with it. Um, and we, we just filled everything up with alcohol. And I needed to leave like within 24 hours in my apartment because things were really getting ugly in the country. We went to the coastline. We went to the coastline and, and kind of hiding out for a good five or six weeks. Um, eggs in the morning and lots of alcohol for lunch and dinner and, <laughs> and, and just keeps going. And breakfast, yes. First, you got to coat your stomach. But um, Roy brought me two books. He brought me a uh, dummy, dummy guides, go figure. Dummies for Excel and dummy stock options. And um, my left brain just said, I don't care how much you drink, there's no way we're ever going to let you understand Excel. So go, you know, and my right brain just said, the only cell you're going to understand is a jail, a jail cell, Alan. So I, I, I <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, <laughs> so that's it. So you know what, so I start just thinking about life, things that went wrong, and I really did, I got good with the options. I, I took to the options and I, I started kind of seeing myself in a new future. What went wrong? What can I share with you? I was definitely too trustworthy in my first business venture. I, um, um, I should have researched the country more. I never just, just never thought about it. You know, we're here. We never think about things like that. And I should have called it quits quicker. You know, who said hang in there you know, to the last you know, very end? Should have totally called it quits. I lost people a lot of money. I lost a lot of money. I lost my friends. So talking about starting all over. So it's over. And I fly back to New York, and I find myself being, I, I, I took, a, I, I entered a stock trading program, and I passed those tests, the 763, I, I passed all these exams. So I'm getting ready to enter a new life. But it's kind of hard now. I'm not the jefe, the boss. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really at the bottom here. And you know, we're at a point in our life, after we finish school a few years out, you might lose your first parent. And I had lost my mother that month. And I'm just th totally just thrown out of my, my rhythm in life. And I'm like, where was I happy? You know, I mourned. You know what I did? I went back to San Francisco. That's hometown, college town for me. And I went back to San Francisco. I found my girlfriend. And next thing I know, I I'm in like this sadistic military stock training program. In at 4 a.m., you, you stay, you know, 4 a.m., a thousand calls a day. I'm a glorified connector. I'm just trying to qualify people to see if they can even invest with this firm. And a thousand phone calls a day, starting at 4 a.m., hit the West Coast, East Coast, Central, you name it. You don't hit your goals in the afternoon. You're staying and you're calling Europe. And if you don't hit your goals in, at night, you're staying and you're calling Australia. And if you don't hit your goals, you're staying and you're calling Asia. You'd stay, stay, stay. And I did this for almost a year. A year. I counted the, the, the calls and I, I, I dialed the phone 300,000 times. And you did it. And you did it. And all the numbers would wash out. You, there's just no lying about it. So I get a break. It's Valentine's Day. 
old friend calls me up. He's like, hey, I just got off the floor of the Merck downtown where uh, they're, they're commodity business. I'm living in Texas right now. We're, we're in this natural gas business. It's just unbelievable. Um, I'm sorry I haven't called you. There's a ticket waiting for you at San Francisco Airport. It's going to Cancun. You're going to be on it. And there's a room waiting for you at the Ritz Carlton. Uh, and your flight leaves like in four hours. So I got my wife or my, my girlfriend at the time coming over to my, my home on Haight Street. It's Valentine's. She's bringing all the food. I wasn't living in a very nice place. And this is, this is a, a problem in, in our relationship because I'm always running off to go do the next thing, right? You know, love it or not, I want to make a lot of money at that point in my life. So um, talk to her. Okay, so now I go to Cancun and it was Rome. It was everything he said it was. I met all these traders. I met all these brokers. Um, I never knew you can spend $10,000 on a dinner until that day. Unbelievable. I never knew you can go into the Ritz-Carlton jewelry store and spend thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. And I'm like, holy shit, what's going on here? This is bigger than Venezuela. You know, and they're like, this is the derivatives market. You know, this is what we're talking about. This is futures. This is contracts. We're in natural gas. There's a new opportunity coming in electricity. You're going to deregulate, they're going to deregulate all the markets in the United States. You want to get in right now. The utility companies will do it first. All the banks are going to follow. And okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. You know, I'll do it. And okay, so go back to San Francisco. I get an offer from that company in Texas. They're going to pay me $24,000 a year, $2,000 a month base. And that's actually more money than I'm making after calling 300,000 people that never want to hear from me in the first place. So we pack our stuff up. She wasn't happy. I sweetened the pot. We got engaged. We went over to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> we went over to Texas, and I'm a clerk. I'm a clerk. And it's humbling, but it's not so humbling. I mean, literally, you know, there's like, there's pits in these rooms. And people are yelling numbers at you, you know, like Palo Verde, five and a quarter, six and a quarter, five and a quarter, six and a quarter. You know, sold five and you gotta, you gotta take everything off the board and you know, people are throwing stuff at you when they're pissed off. And, <laughs> um, you know, but you gotta turn around and get the numbers up because you can't remember how fast they're coming in. You have to hear what everyone else is hearing because you're training yourself to be the one to sit down in the chair and do the job better than they are. Do the job better than they are. So, um, finally get my shot. Six, seven, eight months into being this clerk. Um, they put me in something called West Coast Power. Um, don't have enough time to explain to you what it's really all about, but they've commoditized electricity and they can break it up into segments. You can trade, you know, on Monday you can buy power for Tuesday. Wednesday you buy power for Thursday. And these are utilities and banks and, and they're just trying to front run each other and buy low and sell high, stuff like that. So, I'm on the spot desk. There's, there's the 24-hour business, and then there's the, 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 the term desk where you want to get like these 10-year strips because you get paid for every day you close a deal. And if it's a 10-year strip um, and it takes you one minute to do it, you just made 10 years worth of commission. And I'm just sitting here in this little 24-hour desk, and I just get you know, one day of commission. I'm doing really good at it because I got my ass kicked in San Francisco calling 300,000 people that never wanted to hear from me. So all I had to do is call a bunch of utility traders up and introduce myself and my services. So I'm doing really good with it, but clearly I'm not going to get into the big business. So I think we all find in life when, we've, when we're up against the wall, it's a dead end. I'm going to put some feelers out there and you know, let's see where that takes me. Next thing I know, I'm in New York City. I got an I, I interview over at Bloomberg and, they, and it went great. And they want to take the pits, like everybody else, and put them on electronic trading screens. And so at the end of the, the, end of the interview, they go, well, Alan, um, how much are you making? You know, what do you think I said? $124,000. $124,000. But I can't afford to live in this city. It's so damn expensive, New York City. He goes, this is not negotiable. I think I know people like you. We're going to pay you $175,000. I'm like, I'll tell you what, this seems challenging. I'm going to do this. Done. <laughs> Done. That's what we do in this business. Done. You know, you don't back out of a deal once you say that. And I'm like, well, we have a little problem. The problem is, um, the problem is I need you to move all my stuff 
from Texas to New York. And the second problem is, I need you to pay the closing costs. And Andrew's like, Andrew Hausman, who's the guy who's giving me the interview, he's like, closing costs for what? For the house that I have to buy here in, you know, I, we moved to Hoboken, New Jersey. I need you guys to pay the closing costs. My wife's not going to come to Texas if she doesn't have a home and I got to go back to renting. Meanwhile, we can't even afford to buy two ACs for two cars in Houston, Texas, which isn't a lot of fun, but I'm talking about buying houses. <laughs> so we do it. We do it. You know, I'm like, sweetie, you know, I'm coming back. Just start packing the things up. I'll explain when I, when I get there. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't get it anyway. So, <laughs> all right, so Bloomberg, two years, great company, um, and I'm starting to feel more like myself. I know we got away from the beginning of the story. I really got my ass kicked in Venezuela. It, it, it took that entrepreneurial spirit out of me, and um, I was kind of denying who I was and getting lost, uh, calling all those people that never wanted to hear from me. So, um, traveling all over North America, I'm, I'm, I'm working with programmers, and we have an electronic trading screen. It's my job to go onto the, the trading floors all over North America and train the traders and just to make sure they use it. Um, maybe take them out at night, um, but make sure, and make sure they were using the trading system. When it comes to electronic trading systems, you need the system to be liquid, so you need a lot of people looking at it at the same time. Trades get more trades in life. Okay, two years go by, I'm just loving the place. Next thing I know, you know, opportunity knocking again. There's another company, pre-IPO, um, wants to build an electronic trading system out of New York City. Basically doubles down. 175, we'll pay you 350, Alan. Plus, we'll give you lots of commission. So now I have, a ch and we're going to give you warrants, and we're going to give you options, and we're going to IPO this thing, and we have some utility companies and banks um, that are behind us as well. I didn't want to go. Um, went over to Bloomberg, and you know, I just said, you know, when I first got here, I, you know, I, you know, I kind of just dropped like this, and we have this Shema Yisrael, the Nayel Heno, the Nayel Kav, Baruch Shem Kavod, Michael Tov. I'm never going to leave this place. Thank you, God. Okay. <laughs> So, <laughs> only the butterfly understood that one. But so anyway, <laughs> um, I had to go. You got to go. And I really think I can make like three quarters of a million dollars working for someone else. And it was a two-year commitment so I can walk away and maybe get my own, start my own business. And they say, so let me bring up uh, one of my partners as well. So two of us. We go, we leave. Bloomberg, they, you know, they can't match it at all. They, they gave me a 5% raise. Um, we move, and we're there for like a, a good half a year. And I got to tell you, right before, there was this product coming out. Same idea, you know, pits. Five and a quarter, 575, five and a quarter, 575, you know, split five. It's all five and a half. I'll do one, two, three, four. Where are you, you know, you know, and you want to take that stuff, and you want to put it on screens so you can live a longer life. And um, <laughs> it was taking a while. The software was coming out slow, and we, we had all these sales trips. There was, like, there was this one team. It was 44 people. 40 of us were going to go out, hit the market at the same time, introduce this new trading product. Uh, the market was waiting for it, and it turned out that uh, the, the developers didn't meet the, the deadline. So... 38 people of the 40 canceled their sales trip. And I'm just thinking, you know what? I just want to go. I want to go to the West Coast. I got all my friends. This is my life. And uh, so me and my partner, we're getting ready to go. We get a call from the CEO. He's like, one guy's got to stay in the pit, guys. One guy's got to stay in the pit. So I'm going back and forth with Stu like this. And you know, I'm thinking, I just moved into a new home. Uh, my wife needs my help. We're in Hoboken, New Jersey. I got the trade center in the background. And um, Stu, but Stu's wife's pregnant and he has a baby. And he's like, Al, you know, you go, I go, you go. And finally, I'm like, you know what? I'll go. I'll do it. I'll go. <laughs> right? So I left September 10, 2001, took an elevator down from the 101st floor of the World Trade Center, got in a car, went to Newark Airport, flew to Portland, meeting customers, uh, I believe it was Enron. And um, I woke up. You know, I woke up September 11th to my, you know, my cell phone's ringing off the hook and, and you know, now you know what's going on, right? I turn the TV on and we all see what's happening. Um, you know, that day, we lost 700 out of 1,000 people in my company. We had the top five floors of the World Trade Center, the North Tower, 
And turns out I lost 40 out of 44 teammates. <sighs> so I'm just, I'm just amazed. You know, it's like, ah! You just, you know, I, I'm sitting there in, on my bed in this hotel, and you know, there's not a lot of communication in the world, but we can see what's happening on the screen. And you know, the first, t you know, when that first tower fell. And I'm kind of like a leader at this company. And you know, I gotta, I gotta get on the phone. And I gotta start calling people. And I gotta start calling the spouses and and and, and the parents. And and I mean, we just we just got wiped out. I mean, just I don't know if there's if just say if there was 40 people in this room, um, only you know, it was a CEO, CFO, me, and a and a drunk clerk that didn't wake up on time. We were the only survivors in this mess. And um, you know, so I I spent this week by myself. And you know, once I got past the, the, the morning, or, or it's hard to put it in words, then you start focusing on yourself. Because now I'm wiped out again. You know, I had an opportunity to probably make three quarters of a million dollars. That will never be the same. Forget the warrants and the stock and all that stuff. Um, just parked a lot of my life in a new home. The backyard was the World Trade Center. Um, the whole reason for living down there was because I could walk five blocks, catch a train, be in the World Trade Center. That train's gone. It's all gone. It's all gone. Nobody wants to live down there. They don't know what they're breathing, and no one knows what's going to be the next attack. I changed my life that week. That was, that was a, a, a moment, and um, I made a lot of decisions, but I can tell you that I decided I was going to be more of the business person, the more entrepreneurial person that I am. I kind of realized it's all gone. What do we got? What do I got to show for the last five or ten years? Had I had my own business, maybe build an asset, a brand, I'd have that. So I got to do it different. I just absolutely have to do it different. I was afraid. I, uh, I'm, I'm staying away from the emotional side of all this. Um, but, you know, I, I'm feeling scarcity. I can't afford what I just got involved with. And uh, I'm, I got to change it. So I go back, finally. And there's one more story I'm going to share with you. I hired this kid, Dougie. Um, out of one of the Hoboken bars, thought I'd give him a chance. He's there for two weeks. He, he's up there. You know, he, was, he was in the building. His father's a steel worker putting up um, a tower on the Jersey side and just sees this all happening. And I'm having these conversations with these people and you know, I'm, you know, it's very emotional time for me. All right, business. All right, so turning it all around, I go back to um, New Jersey. The company tries to pull out of it. They tell me I had to go to Houston <coughs> where they had a satellite office. They gave it their best shot. Um, so me and my wife are there now um, in a place called Paraland, Texas. Anyone ever hear of Paraland? Pa Pa well, uh, you know what? The only thing funny that ever came out of Paraland, Texas was my joke, which was there's not too many Jewish-Japanese couples pushing around their baby in <laughs> Paraland, Texas, all right? So um, they closed down. I got fired. I actually had a, I had a contract, but I got fired. I'm driving home that day, and I'm re reminding myself of the things I said I was going to do when I was alone for that week. And I drove over to Radio Shack, and they were having like a two-for-one phone special sale. I bought two phones for $39.95. I'll never forget. <laughs> they can take like 18 lines. And I called the phone company up. I ordered 18 lines from my house. And um, I'm in this four-bedroom, two-house. Paraland, Texas, in the middle of nowhere. I can't sell it. There's 10,000 homes going up across the street. No exaggeration. And um, the world's changing, too, because not only are we worried about terrorism, we immediately went into a mini recession. And for some reason, not for some reason, utility companies were deemed not safe anymore because everyone figured out they were involved in derivative trading, which they had more liabilities than anyone could ever imagine. So every single utility stock plummeted to less than a buck. So then here's me, I got my two phones for 40 bucks, and um, I decided that I was going to start brokering these trades from my home. It's a deregulated business, there were no rules. So I just started calling up all the companies, all the banks, and I created, I created a special product. I, I, um, I had to limit my financial responsibility, so I created a 24-hour market where we just trade every hour so people can just commoditize it and, and flip around and some utility companies needed um, hours 7 through 10 in the morning more than others so they'd strip it out so we're stripping all these pieces 
I'm the grandfather of this product, and the first year, um, I'm proud to say I did around $300,000. I would just do these trades, I'd get down to Microsoft, and I would send out the invoices. And by the second year, I think sales were up over like six to 800,000, and I start hiring people. And I get a phone call from someone who knew what I was doing, and he's like, you know, Enron's going out of business at this time. He's like, it just so happens, I got $150,000 of, of, of phone equipment that would help your business grow quicker, I'll sell to you for $15,000. So what do you think I did? You it. I'll do it, <laughs> right? I'll do it. So Takako's out, my, she's my wife now, she's out shopping and I'm like, oh yeah, come, come over to my house and you're gonna set up all this <laughs> shit. <laughs> so I mean, there's a, there's a lot of cabling involved. I mean, these, these, are, the, these are the trading turrets. This is, this is the bomb. This is the stuff when you put a line in, one single copper line goes to the end user on the trading floor or the bank you have squawk boxes, you're in business, it, you know, you're, you're really in business because it turns out you really can't shut this stuff off. So before I tell you why you can't shut, well, you can't shut this stuff off and it's ringing 24 seven now. So my wife's like, what's that? <laughs> so I'm on unemployment. Well, no, 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 not anymore. All right, forget that. I missed the unemployment part. So, but she's like, okay, well, you know, she's like kicking me out of the bed at like 11 o'clock or one o'clock in the morning because she's getting it. She's seeing the money. Right? So, you know, it's like I would just, you know, kind of like throw a robe on and I'd be like kind of scratching my butt, you know. And then I pick up the phone and it's like these traders, thank God you're there, Pacific Gas and Electric, we just lost a bunch of water and, and we need you to go buy up the whole entire market, but don't tell us, don't tell anybody who it is because you always want to hide the identity of the buyer because we can get a huge utility out there. Every single bank and every, you know, scalper is going to really pull back. So um, I became very trustworthy. I would never give up any names until the deals were done. I developed a, a great reputation for myself. All right, so take, um, doing really well. I think we're like two, three million dollars and you know, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling more confident. Maybe it's time to move and HOA. Everyone know like a homeowners association? They started sending letters to my house. They wanted to know why there were so many cars parked in front of my house every morning because all my employees were working in my house. <laughs> all right, so we get out of my house um, and we, we take an office and now I'm going to just speed up the, the story now. So it goes for like 10 years, man. It was like uh, uh, 2 million, 4 million, 6 million a year, 8 million a year, 10 million a year, 12 million a year. It's really, we're doing really well now. I, I learned, I, I wasn't just doing the spot market. I was doing those big tickets. I was buying those dinners. I was taking people out and um, turned out I had a buddy in the gas business doing the same thing. So, and, and gas and electricity, they really, it's a spread. They trade with each other. So we decided we were gonna get together. So we built a, a bigger office, and next thing I know, there's like maybe 50 people in the office. And um, we got revenues of, I don't know, like 20, 25 million dollars a year now. So we're really starting to think about, not public, but, but jumping into a company that was about to go public. Um, it was a possibility. I mean, I might actually have a five, 10 million dollar payday here, I built something and it's time to move on. So does anyone remember 2008 and a half? That was the credit markets drying up all across the world, especially in the United States. That was our customers going out of business. Who would have thought? I mean, Lehman Brothers would go out of business. I mean, these were people that sent me checks. These were people that entered in 10-year, 20-year trades with other companies that were going to be vastly affected if those contracts defaulted, which they did. And so Bear Stearns. So they all had this exposure to each other, so everyone just stops trading. And when you're, when you're sitting around with a bunch of guys and you have a bar in the office <laughs> <laughs> and a kegerator in the office <laughs> and they have their Lamborghinis, they have their Porsches and their Range Rovers, um, everyone gets scared quick, very quick, because uh, the first day of the month, you don't have anything on your sheet, and um, everyone's income just immediately got cut 50%. So I'm, I'm seeing all this now, and I'm thinking Venezuela. I'm thinking, what did I learn from my other past events? I'm, I'm seeing talks of government re-regulation on the deregulation, and I'm like, you know what? I'll sell my shares for a million dollars. Who wants them? Right away, someone took me. I got a million dollar package. I walked out of there, I never looked back. I left a lot of money on the table, but I had to make a decisive decision. 
So I go home. Hey, Takako, how you doing? Uh, she never really talk about. One of the reasons why brokers get paid a lot of money is it's so emotional. You don't want to talk about it. You just you can't win the, the conversation. Um, like, let's just go to Japan. Let's go take. I need some time off. So and we go there a lot. I'm like, let's, so we go there for a month, I'm hanging out in Japan. And let me tell you something. Here's what I did different. In in, in meeting with Mark today, um, my core point today is going to be real estate. But here's what I did different. I just can't tell two stories at the same time. But at the same time, I started buying single family houses in Texas. And I kind of came up with this rule, which was, if you can buy a house that cash flows cheaper than a used car, I don't care who you are, you buy it. And I enlisted my partner, my, my partner, I enlisted my wife. And we did this together. So, and it was fun. It was like no longer going to the Galleria Mall and spending $7,000 and getting a little heartburn. We're going to Home Depot and we're going to spend $7,000 and we're going to build an asset together. It's lots of fun. We did great. So we're in a house for like $30,000. Um, first house, Alvin, Texas. Cash flows a few hundred dollars. That few hundred dollars to me was worth millions of dollars. I saw it. Sh I can do this. You can do this. Carlton Sheets and all these guys on television, I, bought, I have all those programs. I mean, you can't go into my bathroom and not see them. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, next thing I know, we did a dozen houses together over a year, and then we did another dozen houses, and another dozen houses. Years going by, you know, get a bonus, buy a house in the energy business. Everyone else around me is day trading, like, you know, leveraging up and day trading, getting their ass kicked. I'm, I'm on Google. And I figured out how to get HUD homes from the government. So I'd get the address and the you know, satellite stuff was just kicking in. And I bought everything in the same area. I knew what the land was worth. I didn't really, you know, I had to deal with the contractor. Don't bullshit me. It's either 2,500, 5,000 or 7,500, nothing in between. That deal worked out great. Before I know, we got 75 houses. So I got 75 houses. I'm out of the energy business. I'm hanging out in Japan. My kid's in school. And I get a phone call from <coughs> Prosperity Bank. They had 25 houses that they needed to move quick, uh, 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 an investor's in trouble. And I'm like, well, I pay $30,000 a house. And they hit me pretty hard, $30,000 a house. But by the way, you got to let me, you know, 80%, I'll put 20% down. So I think that's like 100, 150,000 I had to bring to closing. The only problem was I'm in Japan. And they have to close this deal right away. So I call this the Tokyo Close. And it's Tokyo Close because I'm sitting there in my, my in-law's house and it's kind of a small house. Um, sitting there, and I'm like, okay, sweetie pie, can you get me to the American Embassy? I got to get something notarized. She's kind of rolling her eyes, like, can't you give it a break? I just, I think I might have just broke the news to her that I, I, I fire sold Landmark Power. That was the name of the company, but she was, you know. So I'm like, okay, tomorrow we're going to go out, and you're going to get me to the American Embassy, and, you know, next thing I know, I'm in the Embassy, and, you know, they're notarizing all the papers, and I just bought 25 houses. And everybody with me? Yeah, 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 yeah. okay, all right. So uh, I got to go to FedEx. So I'm like, sweetie, you go ahead, ski G, I'll meet you over there. And um, so I go to FedEx and I send all the paperwork back and, and I finally get to ski G, which is the most incredible place for fish, uh, probably in the world. And there's just all these stalls everywhere and we had our favorite place and kind of like a Bostonian day today, gray, cold, rainy, but you know, there's that like, fish smell in the air and and she's there, and, and I'm more calm and relaxed, and, and I'm just drinking some sake, and <clears throat> here's what I just did. I just, I mean, I bought a bunch of houses for $30,000, easily worth $70,000, $100,000 in a good market, so I captured $40,000 of equity on each house, so let's just round that off to a million dollars. So I just captured a million dollars. Can I cash in a million dollars at that time? Maybe not, but for sure, my balance net worth, my balance sheet just went up a million dollars, and that's the banker's game. And that's how you borrow and borrow and borrow money, a lot of it. So I just appreciate, I just, I'm having a good month. <laughs> I got rid of landmark power. And now just from a few phone calls, I just picked up 25 houses. And um, by the way, um, Timothy Ferris, four hour work week. Yeah, I learned this whole virtual assistant thing. I had a, a girl, Christine, out of, England. She's running the whole housing portfolio for me. She's like the <laughs> firewall. She's keeping all that negativity away from me. And uh, I'm pretty good with the books and CPA, you know, just I'm, I'm good with stuff like that. But she's doing all the heavy lifting. So more importantly, one of the key messages tonight, and I'm sitting there in Skijian with my wife, 
um, she thinks maybe I just bought a house. And if I tell her I bought, you know, I just realized a million dollar gain, she would go spend it. Like, I just realized a million dollar gain. So um, we do that. And I realized I just really increased my cash flow $5,000 a month. And it, that's what I've been searching for all my life. That just, you know, that cash flow is security. And I, you know, I had cash flow elsewhere, but that was pretty cool. Now, some people are saying $5,000 a month isn't a lot, and I, some don't. But if you do say that, well, I didn't just say 5000 I said, how many times can I do that? How many times do you need to do that? You wanna, you wanna do, do you want to buy an asset that kicks off $5,000? Do you want to buy that kind of asset 10 times? So now you have $50,000 a month cash flow? Or maybe I like 100, 100000 by, you know, 100 $100,000 a month cash flow, I mean, not bad, right? Not bad at all. You know, passive cash flow, it's working by itself. It's like an ATM machine. So I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, no more bank deals. How, how, I don't think I'm gonna get them anymore, so what am I gonna do? And commercial real estate's on fire. Nobody wants it, no one's lending money. People need to refinance out of their deals. Um, owners want out, so I'm thinking, um, there's actually a guy, a Harvard graduate, I read his book, and on apartment buildings. I'm like, I'm going to go buy apartment buildings. So I got on Google, uh, not Google, there's a loopnet.com, and I found something that I liked. It was in the area that I knew. And next thing I know, there's this cosmetic dentist um, who owns the building. He just wants out. I can control a 76-unit building for $60,000 down. $60,000 down. Um, a two, two million dollar asset. And I think it's worth a lot more. <clears throat> but so, and I think I can make $5,000 a month. So I'm getting close to that $100,000 a month cash flow. So a month later, I fly home and I'm at the closing and I learned an important lesson. I got a lot of credits, deposits, uh, tax rebates, and I only needed $30,000. So to answer this question right now, what do you do if you lose all your money, you lose all your contacts, and how do you start over? I mean, for $30,000 a month to control a $2 million asset that should kick off $5,000 a month, would someone lend me that money? Happens all the time. And that's just a launch, that was a launching ground for me. I didn't need to borrow anyone's money to do it at the time. So I got the first one. Um, I got a little uh, publicity for doing it in the area, and, and people started coming to me, and it was easy, it was getting easy for me to partner up. If you do it once, you can do it 100 times. You buy one house, you can buy 100 houses, right? If you, um, if you sell one bottle of soap, you can sell 10,000 bottles of soap. Okay, so here's where I'm going with this right now. So I'm, doing, so I'm meeting people. I'm gonna give you a few more apartment examples because I'm really into apartments right now. Um, during that time, I mean, the, the financial crisis, things kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse. The first building I bought, I spent like $24,000 a door. We call it a door. Houses, units, doors. And next thing I know, there's one and a half mile down the road on sale for $12,000 a door. And it was like someone opened up some kind of uh, collateralized mortgage or whatever and they needed to sell it right away. Um, how could you not buy it? So we buy this thing for $450,000. I take on a partner, um, put $50,000 into it. We're in it for a half a million dollars. The appraisal comes back for a million and a quarter. I mean, it is during the worst time in history since the Great Depression. Bank calls us up and says, you can have all, you can have your half a million out. And by the way, you can take another quarter of a million dollars tax free. So I'm like, cash flow is king, cash flow is king. I don't need your money. Keep it. So a um, week later, big auction, 160 unit building, monster building, a mile down the road from everything else I just bought takes $200,000 to walk into the auction. I called Nick up over at the bank. <laughs> hey, Nick. Yeah, I'll take that quarter of a million from you. <laughs> so, <coughs> I got it. I won the auction. Okay, I won the auction. <coughs> Sorry. $2.1 million. Is good? Good? Yes? Yeah? Yes. All right. yes. How am I doing on time? Okay. Bought this asset for $2.1 million. I actually have three partners on it, there's four of us. And um, ran it for three years, almost three years. Paid $10,000 a month cash flow. 
$10,000 a month cash flow. It's closing next week. We're selling it. It's done deal. The guy put down $50,000. He's doing it. It's closing for, we paid 2-1, it's closing for 3-5. We're realizing $1.4 million just because we, we stepped up to the plate during the worst possible time and we said, you know, I'll do it. I'll take that. Here's my, you know, I want that building. So we just realized a $1.4 million gain on something, plus it made a few hundred thousand dollars over the years. More importantly, we're rolling it forward on a 1031 exchange, which basically means you don't have to pay any taxes, and we're buying office space. So my awareness is growing. I'm getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And now we're looking at $10 million properties, and I'm not looking at $10,000 houses anymore. So we're expanding. We're growing. Very important principle for everybody. Um, let me just tell you. I'm going to really speed things up right now for the apartments. So you know, at one point, I was a houseaholic. If I wasn't buying a house, I was in the worst fucking mood. Every, I mean, I, sorry. I, I, every 30 days, I had to have a house. <laughs> Um, and now I'm an apartment attic. Every 90 days, I have to have an apartment. And so I'm a little excessive. And, and that happened. I bought REOs, I bought Fannie Mae foreclosures, everything was distressed. I'd buy stuff that you take the boards off, paint, shine, carpet, and fill them up. I bought stuff 10, 20, 30 cents, 40 cents in the dollar, and you can still find stuff like that. You just have to look for it. You have to be aware. I figured out how to build a company out of this. It's just not going to be me anymore. And right now, we have 1,400 units. And when I couldn't buy any more apartment buildings, I bought the property management company that was running my apartment business for me. And I decided I was going to start, it was a strategy. You know, we're going to go deep, 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 buy, 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 buy. And instead of hanging out there, because prices are getting high again, we're going to start picking up new customers and we're going to manage their stuff for them, deep and wide. So we picked up like another 1,100 units under management, so now we have 2,500 units. Really don't even have a sales force, it's just reputation. And it's, it, it's, it's north of $100 million of assets. Um, right now, like I said earlier, we control 50% of that. And we're selling properties for the first time right now and, and we're flipping our way up. We're just flipping our way up. And you know, I'm going to let it ride because i got the cash flow behind me now. You know, I'm not so worried about um, poverty. You know, I have a lot of other things I have to worry about. Okay, so that's the apartment story. And really where I want to go with that is I, 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 I want to give back. I want to help. Um, we did something we don't normally do. We, we bought a 39-unit building like a half a year ago. It was just money on the table. Someone needed to get out of it. We bought it. And we painted it for like $20,000 and we flipped it and we, closed, we made $300,000. And the reason why I'm telling you this story is because a friend and me uh, made some kind of internet course out of it. And we followed the whole, you know, from the start to the finish to the sell and pictures. And it's a video course and it's like seven or ten segments. And um, if you folks email me, I will send you that course as a gift. And, I, and that's what I meant. This can really help you pay your way. I mean, education never ends. So you're going to always be paying for education, but it'll help you pay for your education. Um, <coughs> it, it, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to teach you how to flip small apartment complexes. How much money do you need? Didn't you, weren't you just listening? <laughs> I, mean, it, I mean, really, if you, found, if you found an apartment building, it was an incredible deal. Um, there's lots of local investment clubs in your area. They're free. Maybe they're $30 a year. Um, there's groups like this. I know you. Yeah, and you know me now. <laughs> you do. And, and I'm going to actually extend an invitation for you to come back to Houston. And I'm going to show you a few things. Thanks. Right. Right? Because, listen, the cash flow, the, uh, what was that one? The one tonight? Okay, so, you know, where, where are we right now? And I'm, I'm going to just kind of bring it all together right now. In the beginning, I was in Venezuela. Um, my ego got in the way, I lost a lot of money, and um, I should have called it quits. So you really just have to know when to call it quits and, and walk away. And then from there, I just wanted to lose myself because I was suffering so bad from the loss. Um, I decided I was going to be a stockbroker, and I called 300,000 people that never wanted to hear from me in the first place. And I guess I developed some character through those phone calls. All right. Then I find myself humbled as 
as a clerk, getting people's dry cleaning, putting numbers on a board, being a lunch boy, but that spirit, that entrepreneurial spirit's coming back, and I'm getting ready, I'm thinking, I, this shop's gonna be mine one day. Which it kinda was, but that's another story, and a few lawsuits. So, um, <laughs> so, um, okay, so yeah, so then I, I had a foray through a few Fortune 500 companies, and here's what I have to say about this which is, you know, it, you, you, it's okay to grow the company, but if you outgrow the company and you're not getting paid what you're worth, well, move up. Just move up, all right? So that's why I can pass along from that. And then from, you know, the 9-11 the experience, I mean, the first time in my life, something or someone else controlled my emotions. I never had that. I, I, I you know, when those, when those towers went down and, and the terrorism, you know, those people did something to me that, it's kind of priceless. I, I can't, I can't, I'm not talented enough to explain what they did to me in words. So, um, you know, it's guard your heart. You got to just guard your heart, guard your emotions. All right. So, um, that's that the 9-11 experience. And then, um, landmark power. Awesome. You know, that's like kind of mastery coming together from all the lessons, everything I've been through. It, it, it all just fit well. And, you know, I was the master. And innovation, just so important. I mean, holy, unfortunately, when you get out of school, I think you have 18 months before everything's obsolete that you just learned for the last few years. So it just never stops. You gotta innovate yourself, and you gotta innovate the businesses that you're in. And that's what made Landmark Power so successful. I never really finished a story about it, but did around $50 million in business. And same company that I started with bought it. <laughs> so, um, all right, so hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. So I'm at Canada, we're moving on. Real estate, you know, so real estate. So you guys love going to school. I spent the day with Mark, and I know Mark loves doing certain things, but he needs to build a secondary income, all right? Secondary income. So I want to leave you guys with, when it, when it comes to secondary income and real estate, um, four words, not four letters, four words, all right, that it's really kind of, the message here, um, which is cash flowing, appreciating assets. Cash flowing, appreciating assets. You have to get that in your life. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter you know, if you make a lot of money or, 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 or don't make a lot of money over here, but time is going to pass us all up. It's just inevitable. So you know, when I was in the commodity business for 10 years, I bought, you know, approximately 100 houses. And w when I was working for other people, I didn't. So the point is, I mean, you're, if you're 30 years old, what's, what's it going to be like when you're 40? What are you going to have? All right? So buying cash flowing, um, buying cash flowing assets, very important. And shoot, all right, hang on one second. Gave you the free offer. Okay. All right. I'm going to try, I'm going to, try to wrap it all up now um, without getting too spiritual. But, you know, th this whole journey, it's, it, it's not the getting. It's not the getting the money. I got wiped out twice, close, I, almost three times at one point. Um, it's not the getting. It's really the becoming. It's just the becoming. It's, it's, it's the journey. And I can get wiped out in a few weeks, maybe a hurricane comes along or, or, or something. Um, I'm so much ready now to get in there. I'm not going to start with $100,000 houses. I'm not going to start with a million dollar building or a $5 million apartment complex. I can get in there, I'm going to start buying $10 million office towers. And it's just a phone call. So we're, we're constantly evolving and um, you need to do the same. You just have to be aware that it's happening. All right. So. Like, I got this phone call a few days ago to be here, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, it's kind of an easy subject, but um, I don't know. It's not natural for me to be up here. Um, I'm, I'm better. I'm, I'm a good boss. I like to yell and scream and fire. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, if anyone ever asks you to get up in front of a group of people to talk about you know, losing money and coming back and losing money and coming back, 
You know, you got to just stop and take a step back and say, I'll do it. I'll do it. Because it's all the becoming. All right? I think with that, I'm going to close. Oh, okay. Yeah, one quick question. Okay, so yeah. I want to ask you the same question I asked Lynn, which is. I'm listening. Was I too slow? No, no, all right, all right. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, I got, let's, say let's say it's me, Mark. I got five grand in the bank. I'm average intelligence. I don't know you. Well, let's say I do know you now because we all know you now. Right. But you're the only millionaire in these three gentlemen that we've ever met. I'm kind of smart. doesn't matter how old I am. All right. What do I go do? You said I got to get a house. Well, how do I find the deal? Can you give me some steps? What do I do tomorrow? What do I do next? Okay, and we'll address some of those questions right now. Um, my course will be great. Okay, so All the right. course is going to cover a lot of that. It is, from You're start to... You're starting us off with big num apartment building. Well, well d don't scare yourself. See, a lot of people have pr a transitional problem going from single-family houses to multi-family housing. Um, it's a small apartment complex. That's it. It's a small... It's just, right, psychology. We talked about it a lot tonight. It's just a small apartment complex. You know, um, 39 units. That's it. You know, maybe 12, you know, maybe 12. But so there's a lot of local investment clubs. You really, you got to take advantage of, look, there's incredible education around here. I mean, I congratulate you all. This is great. You're here. It's almost nine o'clock. Um, you have it. You just, you know, you're the one stopping yourself. So, <clears throat> I mean, I bought houses. I, maybe you felt like, maybe you heard some of the story was, well, Alan, you had some money to go buy some real estate. Well, I'll tell you what, um, having some money is relative to um, different people. And I was borrowing hard money left and right. I didn't want to dent my bank account. You know, I already got beat once, and I like to put things away and never take them out again. Um, hard money lending. It's kind of expensive, but uh, maybe someone lends you, maybe you find a great deal. It's a $100,000 house, and you can buy it for $50,000. There's people that will lend you money at 12% all day long and a few closing points all day long. No money out of your pocket. You guys are absolutely nuts. If, if money is what's concerning you, I got other concerns. I mean, it's easy. You know, it's, it's, it, it, it is so easy. And, and, and you're such incredible people for, I'm sure everyone has an incredible story to get to where you are right now. So, you know, it's just, it's just a, you're, you're there. It's, it's almost hard for me. Like, I, I, I was tired, I had to get ready for, I mean, I had to write a close. But, um, I mean, I kind of wanted to, you know, I wanted to nail it into your head. Buy that office yeah, yeah I mean, I just saw. Just buy this office building. I, yeah. Like, uh, it's easy, use someone else's money, go buy it tomorrow. Yeah. It's just really that easy, that's your message. Yeah. Find the deal, get someone else's money. And build read, if, if you feel like you need the education, just read up on it. I mean, and watch your Watch a course. I mean, I bought one for 35 bucks at 3 o'clock in the morning one night. I don't remember buying it, but I bought it. Oh, all right. Yep, up, up, up. No, no, that's okay. That's okay. So, listen, my email address is Alan. Sch well, I'll give you. I'll give you one you can remember. Big Al with cheese the third at gmail.com. Big Al with cheese, the number three. That's what I was called in the commodities markets. I was Big Al with cheese. Big Al with cheese the third, because this is Harvard. Big Al with cheese the third, number three, at gmail.com. And here, here's, here's what I like to send me an email in the next 24 hours. I would really appreciate um, some performance critique so I can refine what I just put together three days ago. And when I'm done reading it, I will respond to you. And if this website isn't ready, I will send you the, the seven to 10 links that have the 10 hours of education on it on this $300,000 flip that we did. But would $300,000 pay for a few years here? Yeah. Right? Okay. Big yeah. Big Al with cheese. Three, number three. Is with W I T H. W I T H. Big Al. I'm real easy. Big Al with cheese, 
the number three, because I lost the first two passwords, and um, <laughs> at gmail.com. So what do you want us to write you right now in the email? Don't, uh, it better be, so I, I, you guys um, work so hard to be here, so I want to see how hard it really, you know, I want to see. I want you guys to critique me. I want you to say, you know what? You spent too much time talking about Venezuela. You should have just got right to the derivatives market and the real estate crap. Or, you know, or I, I want to hear about it. Or maybe you should stick to your mind map. You know? So um, definitely. I mean, it's, uh, you know, give and take. Yeah? Uh, for such a day, would you like to connect yourself with the universe? Ah. Uh, what do you mean specifically? Thank you for asking. Um, I love it because, um, I wanted to put it in my clothes, but I didn't feel like I had the right time. I spend an hour to myself every morning. And when I was in the commodity markets, I didn't have that opportunity. I was thrown into this pit, pit of fire. And I have a dyslexic problem, you know, but so I have to memorize a lot of positions, a lot of numbers. Um, I never had the time for myself in the morning. So once I got out of that, that environment, there's never been a time where I haven't spent an hour to two hours to myself every morning. What am I doing? Um, you know, it's the same stuff you probably read about. I'm working on um, my physical body. I do a lot of stretching, a lot of deep breathing. Um, I like to walk and jog. And um, um, mental, I mean, it's unbelievable. You know, I, I, my mind, it's, it's a sieve. I don't know, it's like stuff keeps falling, you know? <laughs> I can't shut it off sometimes. And um, so I just practice slowing it down, you know, slowing it down. Um, so I do that. And uh, uh, spiritual, you know, I definitely, um, I got some, I mean, you've heard some of my lucky events, you know. You know I, uh, um, so I, I focus on those three things in the morning. And I also, I look at my goals every morning. Every morning, I have my yearly goals. I have like it's like 50 or 60 things, and I got these color. I have like a, a smiley chart thing, and um, I go through it every morning to see how close I am to getting to this yellow smiley. You know, there's a green, and then there's like a, a, a red. And um, I, I think you're really successful if you can find a hobby that makes you a shitload of money. I love real estate. I think it's fun. I mean, um, I looked at 40 office complexes over the last few weeks, and um, I can stay here until midnight talking about it. I bought something today for the first time, something I never did before. We bought a data center um, in Houston. Um, Goldman Sachs was there for around a decade. It's been sitting dormant for two years, and they invested millions of dollars in, in all these coolers to, I can't even explain it, but we actually signed contract today, sent over $25,000, non-refundable. Um, so, but yeah, so I'm, I'm buying office space and other things right now. But um, self-control, I don't know if I lack it. <laughs> 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 <I'm so> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, um, I, and I pray actually. Yeah. It's, I have a nine-year-old and I just have this belief if I don't teach him religion, somebody else will. Um, I don't know if I believe in luck. I, I know that came up tonight. I think I make my own luck. Um, did I answer your question? Or too much of it? Uh, what was your question? What do I do spiritually? How do you connect yourself with the universe? Oh. Uh, I, I just feel it. You know, I, I just, I get to the, I, I slow down enough and I try not to think about money. <laughs> 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 And I try to, and, and um, I, I, I just feel it. You know, I feel like I'm sitting in someone's hand sometimes. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you see more any area in terms of real estate purchasing more um, uh, prosperous than, than, than others? Like, I know some investors are maybe like Floyd Mills, or you just look at cash flow. I, I don't think I heard all your question, but I think you just said, do you only buy for cash flow or sometimes you're trying to buy for value? And any, any, any regions you see more, you know, uh, more favorable than others? So I've been in multifamily housing for the last three or four years. 
And I, I, I explained to you folks how I caught a wave. And now I'm seeing top dollar um, for this stuff or where it was five or 10 years ago. So I'm, I'm pulling back a little. Um, it's probably been 120 days since I bought my last multifamily property. Yeah. Yeah. All your buildings were three, three ninety nine is worth one fifty something else. So we're carrying it. We relax with moving. Dude, you should talk to David about that. He's more familiar with the market. But um, yeah, it, it's it, that's a it, that's a personal question. You want to walk away from it? I mean, maybe you should. I mean, look at how many people walked away from their properties. Maybe you should try to have it remodified. Have you? Well, we've been that, but yeah. Refinance? Get it? Uh, yeah. The, the, whole, the whole area, though, is of the press. And this is in uh, Newark, New Jersey. Yeah. Which I still think could come back, but how right. long that's going to take? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry for that. Um, I mean, I'm a value buyer. I was buying this stuff for 25 cents on the dollar. I needed room for error. I made a lot of errors. <laughs> 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 I'm not as smart as you. <laughs> well, no, I don't mean that. So listen, um, oh, go, let's go. Quickly, um, I know you said eventually you bought your own, uh, you bought the management company you were doing. Yeah. But in the beginning, for any beginning investors, whether it's residential or commercial, what, what do you do about the nuts and bolts, the day to day, like the collective rents and the distribution? Okay. So what I did was, well, first of all, um, okay, I worked in a cubicle, and I figured out how to do a lot of that stuff so no one else could figure out what I was doing. So maybe through emails, but I had an assistant. And she didn't even live in the country. And I was you know, giving marching orders, and she was, I couldn't pick up the phone. If I picked up the phone to, tell, to collect someone's rent or something, and I'm sitting in a commodity pit, uh, I'd get hung by phone wires on purpose. You know, they're like, Alan, if you've got something better going on in your life, go do it. We're here to make money. So get an assistant. I mean, I paid, her two, I paid her $200 a week. She loved it. She had a few kids. She lived on a farm. She was in England. Uh, she wasn't working 40 hours a week. You know, she, how long did it really, t how much time did it really take to make a phone call? So there's lots of software that we can talk about. You send me an email that it's incredible. When I first started out, you know, I, I told you Excel never worked for me, or I can do Excel with no formulas. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would keep track that way. But now there's like incredible property management software, $25, $50 a month. Lay it all out for you, send out emails for you. Um, so you got to get an assistant if that's the case. But look, I mean, Robert Kiyosaki came up tonight and he, you know, Robert Kiyosaki said something like homework. Homework means um, during the day you have a job and you work, but at night you'd go home and do your homework you work on yourself so you're gonna have to find the time for me I woke up early in the morning and you know maybe I had to do it after work but I promise you if you take care of those four words cash flowing appreciating assets it's impossible if you follow that formula you're not sitting pretty in 10 or 20 years you know maybe then you pay too much for the property I don't know but if you if you buy it cheap there's plenty of people that just say, I got to get the hell out of here, take it off my hands. So um, I hope that helped, but you'll, in my videos, there'll be more explanations on, on how to run your property management business. But that's not a good reason not to do it. Easy stuff. I, you know, I, you're here. I, that's hard stuff for me. <laughs> All right. Hey, um, why did you make this uh, video course? Um, so there's a lot of money to be made on the internet, right? <laughs> so they say. And I tried it out like, I think it was like, I don't know, um, like two or three years ago. Went to a Tony Robbins meeting with um, David. And I'm staring at Tony Robbins and I'm like, shit, he's making a lot of money standing up there. So I think it was Business Mastery or something. And I'm like, fuck, I, I, I think I can get people to listen to me for three days. So I ran around to the, the, the local real estate clubs in Houston, and I said, okay, we're going to call this seminar at my apartments, and I'm going to teach you how to do what I do. I mean, you'd pay any price right now after listening to me, right? Right? I mean, sure, absolutely. so 
I, I put a $10,000 price tag on it. I sold eight seats like that for $80,000. And I took them to my, I had the 76 unit building that I bought from the dentist. I put $30,000 down. I took them to this little leasing office. It's like 250 square feet. I called Gear up. Got it, I got it, oh, not Gear, but I, 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 got a, I got someone to record the whole event. Got a soundboard in there. And we made a course out of it. And the whole idea was, look, money back guaranteed um, to the people that came and spent $10,000. After spending three days with me, they were just begging me to take their money and they didn't want to do it themselves. So then I figured out, holy cow, you know, this is, I can, I can build a whole business like this and there's legal ways of doing it and I do, I work with SEC attorneys and all this stuff, but um, we sell like a quarter of a million dollars of, of stuff, of like books and tapes and, but then I was just like, you know what? I, if I can convince people to come into these apartment buildings with me, my investors get checks every month. The returns are great. I mean, they're, they're absolutely, they're great. So um, turned out that the materials were like marketing for me. I didn't need to sell this stuff. So why did I make that course? I might do it again. Right. Yeah. Can I hit on that, Alex? Yeah. Guys, with the internet is so powerful right now. Every single one of you is worth a lot with whatever you're good at right now. Every single one of you should have an e-book. Every single one of you should have an online course. That's the easiest way to start. A, to build credibility. Yeah, I mean, when I, when, I, when I met up with Mark today, I just wanted to know his journey, how to get here. You all have that story. Yeah. So look, in closing, um, you know, I hope one day someone comes up to me and says, yeah, I remember, you know, I remember you, you, know, you spoke for you know, an hour and a half at Harvard, and uh, I hope you share your business success with me. And um, I'm the giver, so uh, if I can help, let me know. Um, so... Go forth and prosper. Yeah. <laughs>